Okay, thanks. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, as suggestive, I think, as it is potentially uh, provocative. Um, so I'm going to start out with my conclusions uh, to get out of the way what uh, I'm going to uh, talk about today. And that is the suggestion, it's only a suggestion, it's not even a claim, but a suggestion that some of the public discourse uh, by so-called skeptics has actually seeped or intruded into the scientific community and may have inadvertently, without any awareness, may have contributed to a little bit of a shift or a nudge in the interpretation or communication that uh, climate scientists have engaged in vis-a-vis -vis the public and also their own uh, work. Now, it turns out that there are actually some very strong psychological reasons why this wouldn't be a surprise at all and why, in fact, it would be expected. I'm going to review those reasons today in a peculiar manner to begin with by just uh, flashing up a few words for you to just uh, maybe have a look, or you can also try to ignore them, but do keep your eyes open and maybe have a look at what's happening on the screen there. And no, I'm not going to tell you why I'm doing this. Of course not. <laughs> uh, but just indulge me for a moment. Let me go through this procedure. Uh, Gosh, and there's more. I'm really boring today. Lots of words that have nothing to do with climate science. Or do they? We'll find out. This is what I do for a living, by the way, is show people words. I was waiting for somebody to ask me that question. <laughs> So what was that about? Well, I don't know, but I might tell you later. <laughs> so let me get back to the issue at hand, which is uncertainty in climate science and the effects of that uncertainty on public discourse. Uh, this is a climate sensitivity distribution. The uncertainty consists of, you know, this is one source of uncertainty, is the variance of this distribution. And uh, the public and the so-called merchants of doubt uh, are kind of, you know, of, of the firm belief that they know that we have nothing to worry about. They're sort of at the bottom end of this distribution. And the question now is, where is the scientific community? And where is it going? What is happening to us as a scientific community in this context? Well, let me start out by just briefly reviewing the linguistic landscape. And this is research done by people over the years who have noted that there is this inherent conservatism or this reticence in the scientific community about um, not wanting to appear alarmist and not subscribing to the uh, upper end of uh, predictions and instead trying to migrate towards the middle. Now, this has consequences because there is some empirical evidence that the uh, last IPCC report was actually conservative rather than alarmist. And most recently, uh, Naomi Oreskes and, and collaborators have written a paper where they call this the erring on the side of least drama. Now, I want to go a little further than that today. I want to go and say, well, that's conservatism, all right. We start with that. But let's see if perhaps something more has happened to the discourse in the climate science community. And that is where this concept of seepage comes in, the possibility that there might be some tacit acceptance by scientists of a particular frame or narrative that was actually dictated by somebody else outside the scientific community who may not share our... Um, methods or worldview. So another possibility is that people may, scientists may highlight one aspect over another in a complex situation because they're nudged in that direction by um, discourse, denialist or skeptic discourse outside the community. Now what I'm talking about here 
is not something massive, and it's perhaps something that is not easily detectable. But I think it is worth examining whether the possibility for this exists. And by the way, I'm not talking about bullying and intimidation of editors. That's a completely separate issue. Uh, I will not talk about that today. So why might this seepage occur? Well, there are numerous psychological factors. I'm only going to have time at most to go through three of them. And I'll do that in a moment. But I won't do it until after I complete my experiment, where I ask you to raise your hand if you saw that word on the screen earlier. Thank you. That one. That one. That one. That one. Ah, good. <laughs> Those are catch items, just to make sure you don't just raise your hand all the way through. This one. That one. That one. Cool. This is really cool because, why is this cool? Because those two words were never shown. And yet half of you raised your hand. Uh, to confirm that, this was the first list. Didn't have window in it, it had everything but. That's the second one. It had everything in it but the word needle. And yet half of you thought that you saw uh, the word needle. Now I'm guessing that most of you believe that you don't often hallucinate. I think that's a safe assumption. Uh, your subjective feeling, I know this from other experiments, when you raised your hand in response to window and needle, was a subjective sense of recollection. You thought you had actually seen it, but you didn't. You confabulated a memory of something you never saw. In other words, uh, I made you hallucinate. Okay? And I knew this ahead of time. I knew this was going to happen. I prepared the slides. Obviously, I couldn't have done the slides during my talk. I knew this ahead of time, and I knew I could make you hallucinate at the drop of a non-existent needle. Uh, so, what's the lesson here? The two lessons. Normally, when I do this demonstration, I then go on to say, look, this is what the public is experiencing. Their own intuitions compared to what those remote scientists tell them about the data. And that's why I think we got to have a lot of understanding, even if we don't endorse it, understanding of skepticism and denial. But today, I'm going to apply the very same question, not to the public, but to the scientific community. Um, do we, as scientists, now trust behavioral data, or do we trust our intuitions? So let me now go through the three points, time permitting, um, that I believe might make at least a plausible case for the possibility that uh, what is happening out there in the world has affected scientific discourse. Let me start out with the phenomenon known as pluralistic ignorance. Um, to explain this, here are some public opinion data from Australia which show that the number of people who deny that climate change is happening is actually very small. It's at the order of 8%. The vast majority of people know that it's happening, but they're split on whether or not they think it's human-induced. Okay, that's fact number one. Um, here's the more interesting outcome of that same study. This is now breaking down the opinions of those people I just showed you, those various groups, as to what they think the prevalence of that opinion is in society at large. So let me highlight, this battery must be getting low. Uh, let me highlight the very few people, the 6% who deny that the climate is changing. If you ask those people how many others share their view, they think, oh, about half, 50% of the society. Those people who are in the absolute minority think that only 15% of the people accept the scientific consensus that the globe is warming from greenhouse gas emissions, okay? That's known as a false consensus effect. It goes the other way around as well, which is that the people who are actually vastly in the majority are underestimating their own uh, opinion, and they're overestimating the opinion uh, of the, the red bars, the deniers. Now, um, those effects can have consequences. We know that people normally overestimate the prevalence of their own opinion in society. 
In this instance, pluralistic ignorance is the opposite. That is, that people underestimate the prevalence of their own opinion in society. When that happens, that is indicative, based on previous research, on a systematic distortion of the media landscape. Now, the problem with that is that we know that people shift their attitudes towards what they misperceive to be a more common in opinion, opinion in society than it actually is. We know that people do that. In fact, we even know that climate scientists do that. Climate scientists systematically underestimate the prevalence of their own consensual positions. This research is not peer-reviewed as far as I can tell, but it looks very reputable to me. You can look it up at that website there. So there may be some underestimate of uh, the consensus in the community itself, in the scientific community. What other consequences are out there? What other mechanisms do we have to be at least concerned with as a community? Well, I think stereotype threat is an important variable. And simply put, if people are reminded of a negative stereotype about themselves, their subsequent performance declines. And let me show you how dramatic this is by telling you about an experiment where subjects were given either this statement or the next one. The two are identical except for the first sentence. In the first condition, it says, hey, we want an accurate measure of your ability. Hence, please try really hard on the task I'm about to give you. In the other condition, um, people are said, ah, look, you know, we're not evaluating you. But still, you know, try as hard as you can. This condition is the diagnostic condition. This is the non-diagnostic condition. I'm mentioning these labels so you can explain or you can read the data. Here they are. The crucial manipulation here is whether subjects are African American or white. And it turns out that on this test, there are no differences between races in the non-diagnostic condition. However, in the diagnostic condition, uh, African Americans do significantly worse because their negative stereotype about themselves was activated. We have independent data to suggest that from that experiment. Now, you can, you can drive this further. Caucasian males in this experiment were selected for their high ability in math, high ability, but then they were told Asians do better than Caucasians, right? And despite their high ability, they did far worse in a threat condition where, where they were told about Asian students than in a control condition. So performance suffers. But something else happens, and that is that people disidentify. They're abandoning a formerly valued identity if they're exposed to constant stereotype threat. This is a study I'll just briefly tell you. In a nutshell, what happens there is that they traced 1,400 minority students over three years uh, who were highly motivated on a scientific career uh, and stereotype threat. Whenever they felt their stereotype was threatened in year one, that predicted dropout later. So if you get an email such as this or some other hate email as many of us have gotten, uh, chances are that we may think that doesn't affect us, but you also thought you never hallucinated. So maybe this stuff actually does make a difference. And very briefly, if I have three minutes? Yeah, good, okay. Oh, I'm relaxed now, three minutes, cool. Uh, then I can talk about the third person effect, which pins this down more. This is the last factor I wanna get into. Um, and that is showing that people are not as immune to information generally as they think. Now, the third person effect refers to the finding that people think others are more affected by persuasive messages than they are. But in actual fact, that is not the case. Let me walk you through one experiment, and then I'm going to wrap up. This experiment is vaguely complicated. Um, so there is a control condition where people didn't give any message at all, but they were asked about their attitudes towards fossil fuels. Now, 
in this control condition, people thought that they themselves were less pro-fossil fuel, greener than others. I'm greener and better than you. This is the baseline here. You ask people, how much do you like oil? Oh, I don't like it a lot. How much do your classmates like oil and coal? Oh, they love it. Okay, that's sort of the, the basic idea. Now then, there is another condition in which people were um, presented with a um, denialist script about the myth of global warming. And then people in this condition were asked to provide four different judgments, and this is fairly complicated. They had to say, first of all, how they now themselves felt about coal, how they thought others would now feel, and in addition, how they thought they themselves and others had felt about this before they got the persuasive material. So they were trying to undo in their heads the effect of the persuasive message. And then what you find is that people think that others shift a lot more, 0.54 units, than they themselves think that they shifted. People thought they didn't shift, but hey, we know they shifted as much because in the control condition those scores were much lower. In other words, people think everybody else is affected by TV commercials, but I'm not. Well, the data show otherwise. People are themselves also affected by TV commercials, of course. So the point being that uh, denial can have hidden effects and the case that I'm trying to make is that there are some known cognitive and psychological processes that at the very least should put us on alert to the possibility that some of this discourse has entered into the community. And the open question is whether it has. And I'm out of time, otherwise I'd have five more slides on that. I got one more minute, cool. Then there is evidence for seepage. Uh, <laughs> but it's not in climate science yet. Um, this is, you may know this, there was a famous fraudulent paper published in 1998 that claimed that there was a link between autism and MMR vaccinations. That was completely false, um, but it had dramatic effects on vaccination rates uh, in the UK in particular. And one of the effects it has, and this I just discovered the other day, is that among GPs and nurses, there was a surprisingly high proportion of people who found that link to be plausible. Notwithstanding the fact that at the time when the survey was done, the initial paper by Wakefield et al. had already been widely discredited, although it hadn't been retracted yet. So the evidence might not be conclusive, but it's certainly something that I'd like to point your attention to. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>